Hello and welcome to Conversations Lectures. My name is Fatih Krakas and I'm the Head of Training at All Graduates Interpreting and Translating. Before we start, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are presenting today's lecture on the traditional land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to the elders both past and present. Conversations Lectures is an international talk series hosted by the All Graduates Training Division, Conversations Interpreting and Translating. The series invites translation and interpreting academics, students and practitioners, translati translation and interpreting technology companies, and other researchers and professionals who work in the culturally and linguistically diverse services sector to discuss their research and their works. Now, it has been a while since we were all able to come together in person, so hello and welcome to all of you. Um, and I would also like to welcome all of our online audience uh, watching from our YouTube stream today. Today's lecture, unfortunately, will not be in a Q&A style. However, there will be more interactive webinars in the future where our audience will be able to direct their questions at our presenters. So today, it will be more of a launch and a presentation. The lecture today is titled Quality and Integrity in the Translation of Official Personal Documents and will be presented by Associate Professor Mustafa Taibi and Adjunct Associate Professor Uldus Ozolins from Western Sydney University. We would also like to thank NATI and Multicultural New South Wales who have funded this study. And now I would like to invite Michael Nemerich, NATI National Operations Manager, who will be introducing our presenters today. Michael. Thank you, Fatih. Uh, it is a, a great honour to be here today uh, and introduce this uh, series. Uh, thank you to all graduates for hosting. Uh, so the translation of official personal documents is a largely unresearched and rarely commented upon domain of translation. Whether these are identity documents, educational qualifications, driver's licenses, or employment records, translation of such documents directly affects both the document bearer and the institutions to which they are submitted to gain recognition of an anticipated status. In this presentation, uh, we will hear the findings of recent research, uh, which Nadi was proud to sponsor, uh, to support. Uh, we'll hear about the translation of official documents and the various issues that arise in their translation, the quality analysis of the large sample that they've taken, uh, and the set of recommendations that have come from that. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Aldous Ozolint and Mustafa Taibi up to the stage uh, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for the presentation, and thank you, Fatih, as well. Thank you, Fatih, again, for organizing the event, and uh, to uh, Ismail, as well, for organizing this uh, dissemination event. I would like to thank Nati again for the support provided uh, that, that allowed us to uh, conduct this uh, research project. And the same goes to Multicultural New South Wales, uh, who supported the project as well. Uh, this uh, project, we started thinking about it a few years ago simply because uh, we realized that there was very little research done in this area of translation studies. Uh, but we started working on the project seriously uh, two years ago. That was when we got uh, the financial support from NATI and the Multicultural New South Wales. Um, we got interested in this area of uh, translation studies, as I said, because uh, there is very little research. Uh, we have, um, fortunately, we have a few publications addressing the translation of personal official documents, but these publications are mainly based on uh, professional experience, that is to say the authors professional experience as a translator, not actual uh, research. So we wanted to uh, engage in research in order to find out what are uh, the issues in this area of translation studies and also 
to um, conduct a, a translation assessment in order to find out how we're faring in terms of translation quality and uh, integrity. Um, in this area of translation, um, perhaps it's still common practice for translators to get initiated into the translation of personal documents through other translators as a kind of uh, apprentices. Um, there is uh, training, some training offered within uh, organizations, uh, language services, but there isn't much training, uh, for example, at the tertiary uh, level. This added to the paucity of research and research publications in this area drove us to focus on the translation of official documents. So the main uh, goals or objectives of the project were to elicit the views of different stakeholders, including the translators, of course, including language service providers and end users. We apologize we didn't include the direct clients who uh, provide, I mean, who uh, commissioned the translations, but maybe for <coughs> that would be uh, for another project in, in the future. We wanted to look at the challenges that the translation of uh, personal official documents present, and as I mentioned, quality issues from the perspective of these three uh, stakeholders, but also from the perspective of the analysis or assessment we conducted on a corpus of translations. Uh, through this uh, corpus of translations, focusing on three languages mainly, Chinese, Arabic, and uh, Spanish, we wanted to uh, look at the, uh, the, the quality issues and the quality parameters, including accuracy, including completeness and integrity, including uh, the description of the, of the official features of the documents and so on. Uh, what we did uh, was collect uh, the views of translators through um, a questionnaire. Um, we, were we, were, we were lucky actually to get 115 uh, translators completing the, uh, the, the questionnaire in addition to 16 interviews. Um, I say lucky because given the circumstances and also the um, uh, professional commitments uh, translators have and also given the fact that although we do have uh, around 9,000 certified translators, not all these translators of course would be working in the area of uh, personal uh, documents. The um, questionnaires were also uh, completed by seven language service providers, uh, especially staff members who are in charge of uh, quality, quality assurance. And finally, nine institutional end users from education, um, uh, foreign affairs, and other institutions, institutions that use translated personal documents. And the second part of the research consisted of um, translation quality assessment, and for that purpose we collected 300 documents, 100 from Arabic into English, 100 from Chinese, and 100 from Spanish, and we didn't assess the translations ourselves. Uh, to make sure there was some uh, degree of objectivity. We invited external assessors to uh, do the assessment for us, and these, assess uh, these assessors were not examiners and educators, and also translators, professional translators who, I mean, the same people were also translators who had experience in this uh, area. Over to you, Uldis. Good, thank you. Good, right. Um, I'll deal with the, uh, uh, with the questionnaires, um, the 115 questionnaires, which provided extremely rich material. Um, the, the, the people actually really took the questionnaire seriously uh, and they produced some interesting things. Um, it's always uh, convoluted to present uh, <laughs> statistics, but uh, half the translators said that they receive less than 10% of their, uh, of the, of their uh, source texts through agencies, that is through language companies, which means that for most translators, um, they have direct contact with clients. So clients find them either through the NADI website, um, through community announcements, uh, through reputation, word of mouth, everything like that. 
Um, and indeed only 5% received all their official document translations from agencies. So, um, and this contrasts a great deal then with the uh, other area of community translation, which would be the translation of, 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 of documents um, from institutions which uh, um, focused on service delivery of various kinds, information of various kinds to, um, to non-English speakers. So it's quite a different, um, uh, a different source of the, uh, of, of, of the translations and that involves, of course, different relationships. So um, uh, now we'll talk about the relationships with agencies um, but also the relationships with private clients because um, this is a very high stakes area uh, and in some of the kinds of documents uh, it really is important and the clients are burning that you do the translation in the way they want it done. So we'll come back to that. Um, uh, one of the challenges is the kind of uh, documents that are produced and um, given that uh, we uh, Mustafa mentioned the three languages that we assessed, but the questionnaire was open to all languages. Um, so it was a very uh, broad um, source of um, languages, cultures, countries and so on. And there is enormous diversity in these documents. Uh, even within the same language, in a different country, uh, it can be anything. So, um, uh, and this is for birth records. Uh, birth records, what's the most extreme case? You have uh, a birth record which is three pages long, but you're trying desperately to find the mother's name. Now, it's, it's a situation where, uh, okay, what does the Australian institution want? It wants the mother's name, okay? It's there somewhere. You go find it. Um, or it might not be there. Um, so um, the, uh, so the, uh, the translators recognised um, this great diversity um, and uh, it varied a little bit from the kind of, of document. But one document type stood out and that was educational qualifications. And when I mention the high stakes, this is where it was. So many clients, of course, pressed for the translations to be able to say, this is equivalent to this in Australia. And the translators, as one, and, and this is a great finding, as one, said that's not our job. It's not our job to actually assert the, the um, equivalence of qualifications. Uh, that's the job of other institutions that actually vet qualifications and all the rest of it. Um, but uh, the educational qualifications were um, uh, really singled out. The education qualifications also tended to be, uh, in most cases, longer, longer documents. Some of them could go on for a long page, um, and uh, there's, uh, uh, it, 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 it was an area where we got a lot of comments back from the translators. Now, um, one of the issues that is there in Australia is the issue of um, extract or template translations. Um, Australia was a real leader in this um, and uh, it took the European Union uh, only in 2015 it actually introduced a sort of a, a system of um, a template <coughs> translation where you could extract the most important uh, elements um, and, uh, and that would be accepted in other countries and so on of the European Union. But as Australia really developed this sort of in a a gradual way from the, the around the 90s um, uh, and uh, the uh, issue was about template and full translations what is a desirable translation what is not now um, one of the uh, issues we looked at was the guidelines that are provided uh, OSIT following the New Zealand Society for Translators and Interpreters has issued a set of guidelines for translators on how to deal with, um, uh, with translations and this issue of ec uh, extract versus, uh, versus full translation comes up. Uh, a couple of the guidelines, they sort of seem, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a difficult area. One guideline says the source text should be translated completely and accurately, which we would hope from translations, but 
if the client requires only extracts to be translated, the sections that have been omitted should be indicated in the translation, which sounds very odd that I'm not going to translate that, but I'm going to indicate what it is. Um, or a template for extract translation of standard documents be used that allows for all relevant translated information to be entered. Now, I don't think any translators actually do, um, as it were, give an extract translation, but it's not on a template, and they also include what they left out. So it sounds a little bit like the Indian rope trick. So, but we'll come back to recommendations in a while because, um, uh, and, and, and we'll conclude on that because we have got our own recommendations. Um, now, of the, um, uh, of, of, from the questionnaires, um, half were very happy with extract translations. Um, it's, uh, it's less uh, costly and so on. There were expre uh, expressed concerns. Um, some uh, uh, said uh, there's a risk of leaving out information. Um, one of the examples gi given, well, um, if, if it's material that could be related to a court case, um, it may not be the most relevant material that, that, that somebody would want in terms of detail, but other things in the document might actually be more important in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in a legal case. So it was sometimes hard to judge um, if, if it was an extract, what you actually put in. Um, and uh, of course, many clients are not used to extract translation. They've never seen an extract translation before. Um, and, and so they can react. And uh, while we overwhelmingly were asking about translations from Lote into English, um, the, uh, uh, there, there was also a concern that many of the translators also translated from English into other languages, that's Australian documents, into other languages, and there in most countries um, the uh, full translation is the norm. Um, so, uh, and um, I don't know if that EU um, initiative on, uh, on templates is gaining any traction, um, but in that direction, uh, and it's linked to issues of apostilles and, uh, and certification and so on, uh, that, that um, uh, those uh, documents uh, do need to be full translation. Um, and uh, there were all sorts of formatting considerations. Um, some extract uh, templates are better than others or, or prefer to others. Uh, and uh, many commented that every document is formatted differently. Uh, now, in terms of quality, we asked about quality criteria and probably no surprises here. Um, accuracy in terms of the, 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 the details, um, completeness conveying the necessary and relevant information. Um, there was quite a lot of use of translator notes a very small number said, I would never use translator notes. I would, I would be able to incorporate whatever I wanted in the translation, but they, they were few. Most translators would give translators notes where they felt it was, it was really important. Um, there are other criteria too, clarity and understandability, uh, the actual presentation. Um, yeah, don't try it with a leaky printer. Um, the translator auth authentic or authentication um, and uh, people had various views of what they should authenticate and so on uh, and we'll deal with some of those issues as we, uh, as we go on. Um, and then of course um, while academics think that you prepare, look at quality by prepare, looking at the source text and looking at the translation and saying, hmm, this is a quality translation. Um, translation companies can't do that. Translation companies have to convince their clients that they are going to present quality. So how do they do that? They stress the translator's qualifications and so on. Um, but it reminds us that this is also a commercial activity uh, and um, translation companies have to convince clients why they should come to them. Even though, as we've seen, relatively small numbers of um, personal documents are translated by agencies compared to other translations, still it's an issue. So speed of response, delivery, good relations with, um, uh, 
uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, the agency. Um, and that varied. We got some nice horror stories about relations between translators and agencies, um, but also many good stories. And uh, data safety was another concern, and probably that will be an increasing concern as we go on. Uh, security. Um, now, uh, these figures, I don't want to confuse people with these figures. So two-thirds did not have any security or fraud concerns, one-third did, but that does not mean that one-third of all translations had security concerns. The number was actually very, very small. Um, it was a very small percentage that where they felt there was, but it was widespread. Uh, a third of translators said at some time, you know, the document doesn't quite look like uh, look right. It's it's not um, uh, it, it. There's something odd, um, and this is apart from you know things of legibility or, or handwriting or things like that. Um, but uh, there were issues that that translators did report back to the commissioner, and um, this was also could lead to some uncomfortable relations with direct clients, um, that you think the, 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 the source document is a bit dodgy, um, and what do you do, and in fact uh, a very small number, uh, a very small number of the respondents to the questionnaire said, look, I don't deal with direct clients anymore because of a number of factors, but one of it also was if they present dodgy documents. So um, there, there, there were concerns about that. Now, as with the educational qualifications, um, uh, the, the uh, translators were virtually unanimous that it's not up to them to determine authenticity. If they feel there's something wrong in the, in the, in the, in the source document, they might report it particularly if it comes through an, an agency, um, but it's really not the translator's job to determine uh, authenticity. In terms of training, um, two-thirds have never attended any course or professional development, um, and uh, this uh, suggests that there is a large, uh, large field. Um, there's a bit of a... Um, a rush now to talk about professional documents. David Deck is doing a, a, a professional development session in a few weeks' time. I, I don't know if we have if we have caused that or, or what it is, but um, there seems to now be more interest in this um, because um, while the uh, the translations are usually short um, and usually don't pay a lot. Uh, translators understand how critical they are uh, in many cases, this sort of uh, high stakes thing. Um, the um, quality issues uh, were also asked of uh, the survey um, uh, and we had a small number of responses from uh, language service providers and end users. Um, now they were uh, like the translators, uh, particularly um, uh, concerned, of course, with accuracy, um, factual accuracy, and natural English, um, so that it's, it, uh, uh, it, it conforms with uh, English norms. Um, the language service providers overwhelmingly said that uh, the quality of English was not a concern, though it may be for some emerging languages. Um, language service providers said that translation errors are rare, and often spelling of names, particularly from different alphabets or ideographic systems, so um, where, where there may not always be clear conventions. Um, now, in terms of the guidelines that the language service providers have, uh, uh, half of them had no specific guidelines or style guides, anything like that. Um, some referred to NATI guidelines, which is probably the OSIT or the New Zealand guidelines. Um, but among the small number of end users that we, that we surveyed, um, uh, they did pick up quality issues. Um, now again, it, it, it was a small number, we weren't able to quantify that through the, um, uh, through the, the, the survey. 
um, but they did point to mistranslation or incomplete translations and so on. So the end users, of course, very sensitive if this comes up and it may only be one document out of a hundred that they deal with. Um, but uh, you can imagine an education institution or um, social security or, or whatever uh, being concerned if the, um, if the translation has errors. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, come back uh, and the next one will be uh, Thank you. Mustafa to go through uh, the, our research on the um, actual translation and how they were assessed. Thank you. This, um, as I said, we collected a, corp a corpus of uh, translations from Chinese, uh, Arabic and Spanish, a total of 300 uh, documents, 100 uh, from each language. And we submitted the translations to external assessors. But of course, before uh, uh, sending the documents or the translations to external assessors, we needed to develop um, a template, a template including assessment criteria because uh, simply because we don't have or we didn't have uh, assessment criteria specifically for this kind of documents. So we relied on the little existing literature, especially books like uh, Roberto Mayoral's translating official documents. We uh, used we referred to uh, Marty's um, assessment criteria as, as well, especially in relation to accuracy, because accuracy in the end applies to these documents as well as other types of translation. And we also took, in, took into consideration the findings of the first phase of the, of the research project. That is to say, what the uh, translators themselves said about quality and quality uh, criteria and other issues. Um, here, um, well, I think before I go through this, I'll just give you an idea what areas and what criteria we included in the template so that uh, you are aware what aspects we were looking at. So we had three broad areas, accuracy, completeness, and language. Well, we could say we could say four areas in addition to presentation. And under accuracy, we had accuracy of content and intent, accuracy of details, that is say, uh, names, uh, uh, names of places and uh, people, which are typical in personal documents, uh, whether the translator includes all essential information for the type of uh, document. Then, in the other, in the second area, uh, integrity or completeness, we have whether the, the translator states uh, whether the original certified copy or non-certified copy was cited, that is say the kind of document or source document they worked with, whether the translator describes official features of source document, and we know that's very important in this kind of translation because both the original document and the translation needs to convey a sense of uh, official status. Uh, whether the translator describes unusual features, for example, if there's a strike through or if there's uh, a little segment or sentence uh, which is handwritten in a, in a document that's um, typed, uh, whether the translator uses brackets um, for their notes when, when there is something to clarify or when there is something illegible or something like that, and whether the translator uh, includes a disclaimer, the type of disclaimer that is recommended in the OSIT guidelines. Language and style, uh, whether the translation uh, uses appropriate register, uses language structures and lexicon correctly, and this applies to uh, practically all uh, types of translations. And the last criterion is presentation, whether the, the translator presents contents in a clear, organized, and user-friendly manner. Uh, this applies especially when you have um, a source document that consists of one block of text, a long block of text, and what you present is a template translation, which, need, uh, which obviously needs to be well presented and organized for those end users to uh, ma uh, make use of it. Okay, let's go back. 
So we calculated uh, the average marks of the two assessors for each language. And we also calculated the average mark for the whole language, that is to say for the, um, the, um, the 100 uh, translations from Arabic, from Chinese, and from uh, Spanish. In Spanish, I think we had to uh, discard three of them because of some issues, and the total uh, remained as 97. Uh, looking at the averages, uh, you can say, well, these are the marks, um, because, um, because the assessors were asked to uh, indicate in a spreadsheet whether each of the criteria I mentioned earlier apply, that is to say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. But at the end, they also uh, had to give a mark for the whole translation, that is to say, looking at the different um, quality uh, parameters, they needed to give a mark, which would indicate the overall assessment of that translation. And calculating the, um, the, average, the averages, um, we had, uh, for example, around uh, 88 for uh, Arabic, 78 um, um, for the second rater, and average for uh, both raters as 83. And if you look at the last column, you will find above 83 for the three languages, which is a good indication in the sense that indicates that um, the quality was there. But as we know, uh, averages do obscure reality because this is the, these are the averages of the 100 documents. Obviously, there might be, there might be uh, translations within the corpus that did not meet the quality cr criteria. And roughly, these ranged from 12 to 15 percent in each language. This is a small minority, but it is a minority of concern because especially in this area of translation practice, it is very important to get translations um, uh, properly done and uh, uh, meeting the quality standards, especially uh, in terms of accuracy and integrity. Uh, looking at the specifics of the uh, assessment, in terms of accuracy, you can see that uh, generally it's good. Uh, above 80 is uh, a good um, indication of uh, accuracy. But again, in this kind of document, the slightest error in terms of accuracy can be, uh, can be uh, very uh, serious. Uh, I, I teach community translation at Western Sydney University and uh, I dedicate two weeks for the translation of official documents. And the other day, a student of mine uh, translated um, uh, a transcript where the transcript mentioned um, psycholinguistics and she translated it as psychology. Well, obviously for this kind of document, just this tiny, apparently tiny error can be uh, significant, can be serious, because it changes the qualification completely. Um, anyway, uh, looking at the overall picture, the numbers look good, look healthy. You have um, um, accuracy of content and intent above uh, 48, uh, uh, sorry, above uh, 84 for the three languages. Accuracy of details also above 89. Uh, including all essential information above uh, 74. So this is not an area of concern in general, but of course there are those exceptions I mentioned earlier, around 12-15% of, uh, of all the translations we um, assessed. Or someone else did, <laughs> did for us. Okay, uh, in terms of integrity, um, in this column you will see um, small figures, low figures, but mostly because uh, that criterion didn't apply. The assessors put an A, it didn't apply. So it's not that the translators failed to describe unusual features, although they were there, uh, they simply didn't find any unusual features in the source documents. So that criterion didn't apply and therefore that's not a concern. But uh, you will see that there are highlighted numbers, uh, for example, in relation to stating whether uh, the translator saw 
an original document, a certified copy, or uh, an electronic copy. Uh, you can see, for example, in Chinese, uh, around 50% uh, did not do that, did not indicate the kind of uh, source document they processed. Spanish, as low as 5.2. Uh, um, another area, um, the last column, includes tran translator disclaimer. Not every translator, at least uh, in the corpus we assessed, not every translator did that. Uh, in Arabic, uh, around 70%, which means that around 30% did not do that. Um, in, in Spanish, um, a low figure as well. Well, at least you can see that the majority of the translators still uh, include a disclaimer as recommended by the NATI, and uh, not the NATI, the, um, the AUSIT guidelines. But you can see, you can also see a percentage of uh, translators who fail to do that. In terms of language and style, uh, Uldis mentioned earlier that end users are not generally concerned with the quality of English. Um, but here, the assessors did mention uh, language issues. Language issues in the sense of a lexical choice, for example, uh, issues with terminology, wrong t terminology or terminology that's not uh, as accurate as it should be, and also formulation issues, uh, sentences that are poorly uh, written in those translations. But fortunately, as I mentioned earlier, this is just a very minority, a uh, very small number of the translations we dealt with. Um, the first column is uh, okay. Mm, the second one uses language structures and lexicon correctly. You have a low figure, relatively low figure there, which is 72. Um, it's not uh, worrying if we go back to the uh, naughty, uh, the old naughty uh, system where uh, we had 70 as an acceptable, I mean the minimum mark for uh, naughty accreditation. But still, as I said um, earlier, uh, you would expect more for this kind of uh, translations, especially from professional translators who have been working in the field for some time. Was that you or me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in the same spreadsheet, we asked um, the assessors to indicate very briefly, uh, in the form of dot points, areas for improvement. That is to say, once they had assessed the translations, uh, what specific areas those transla uh, translators or translations um, uh, needed to improve. And this is the list of the areas they uh, mentioned. Completeness, information missing in translation, and this was mainly because uh, some translators did not mention whether they were doing a, or offering a template translation, an extract translation, or a full translation. Uh, that's why I think we do mention in the guidelines that it is important to indicate that if you're doing a full time, a full time, <laughs> a full translation, uh, indicate that it is uh, a full translation. If you're doing uh, an extract or a template translation, uh, the same. Accuracy, uh, cases of distortion of meaning, incorrect lexical choices, as I mentioned earlier, and the uh, terminology. Specifying the type of document that was uh, cited, and this uh, should uh, offer the end user some uh, reassurance in the sense of what kind of document or source document was translated, whether the translator was uh, looking at uh, apparently original document or an electronic copy, which is very, very common nowadays. Uh, language and register. Um, especially for this type of uh, documents, we know that the expectation is that the register would be high, uh, official uh, language. Uh, this is not the kind of community uh, translations that we offer or uh, publish for the sake of community members to, uh, let's say, to uh, uh, raise awareness among them about healthcare issues or something like that. Missing or incomplete or poorly expressed translator disclaimer, not the full disclaimer recommended by OSIT, and in some cases, in a couple of cases, poorly expressed um, disclaimer. Specifying whether extract or full translation, I mentioned that. 
and description of official features. Once again, that's a very important aspect in the translation of, of, of personal documents because uh, this, this is something we uh, mention in uh, recent publications that arose out of, out of this uh, project. Um, this, th this aspect of the translation needs to make sure that, uh, or the purpose of this aspect of the, of, of, of the translation is to give the end user a sense of the official features of the document and mm, for the end user to get a sense of what happens in the source document, uh, what looks normal, what looks typical, what looks abnormal, and so on. Because if there's something that calls the translator's attention, the uh, officer who processes, the, uh, processes the, the translation should be aware of it as well. And you're next to all this. Yeah, good. Good, thanks. We uh, ended by working out some, some guidelines. Now, we're, we're aware that there are guidelines, well, originally from the New Zealand Society of Translators and Interpreters, and then um, uh, uh, Osset, with, with permission, um, sort of took that and, uh, and uh, developed uh, guidelines very, very similar to that. Um, but uh, we were uh, very concerned that uh, previously the, 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 the guidelines really only refer to translators, what translators should do, and we believe that this is part of a system. It's, it's part of a whole um, process um, from uh, source documents through to end users, and uh, so we included um, four sections. One is general information about the translation of personal documents, giving some features about the nature of these documents. Um, we had uh, general guidelines for end users, um, that's organisations who use these translated personal documents. Um, we uh, had a section on good practice for translation agencies and translation services, uh, knowing that many of these translations come from outside of, of that source, but still um, it, it's important that the, the translation companies still have uh, a significant um, input here. And then detailed guidelines for professional translators who work with, um, with personal documents. So there were four sections. And um, really, uh, the guidelines up to now have really only dealt with the translator end of this, um, and, and we think a, a broader set of guidelines are necessary. So, um, yeah, the previous guidelines only address translators. Uh, the recommendations to end users, um, and this is uh, institutions, can be educational institutions, can be um, uh, private companies, uh, can be... Um, Social Security, any, any sort of government uh, organisation. Um, uh, in, interestingly, if you have a look at their websites, very few of them, they, they will all say uh, we need translated documents and many of them say uh, translated documents by an accredited or certified translator. But um, almost none of them will say do we need extract translations or do we need full translations. Um, uh, and uh, also in terms of issues of um, authentication or so on, there's virtually nothing there. So it's often a one-line thing. You must present a, um, a, 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 a translation from a certified or, or accredited translator, and that's, and that's basically it. Now, there are only a very few exceptions. One of them is uh, the Australian Health Practitioners Regulation Authority. Um, which looks at uh, all health um, uh, uh, qualifications from overseas. Uh, this is a very, very high stakes um, uh, issue here with the translations. They have extremely detailed guides. They will not take extract translations and they specify what the process of getting the translation from translator to the institution is. Um, so it's um, very clear guidelines um, and um, uh, but look, uh, so far it's the only one I've found. Uh, it's the only one I've found that, that, that gives such details uh, about, um, about how translation should be, uh, should be produced. 
Um, so there's clearly uh, a need there for some further education of end users. Um, we can spot the big end users, they are the, uh, the educational qualifications and the professional qualification bodies um, which, which are the ones uh, and um, maybe some, some, some targeted uh, propaganda there would be quite useful. Um, now language service providers um, uh, and we did get uh, both from the replies from the language service providers, we saw that they had different um, ways of handling this, but also from the translators. Um, they had um, uh, many stories about relations with agencies. Um, uh, so the worst one, oh, the worst one was terrible. It was uh, a, a very fully written um, uh, uh, account of where with this one particular agency the translator has to present a good final copy um, with stamps and everything like that. It goes back to the agency, then the agency asks them to make changes. And this could go on three or four times, and, but, but the, everything that has to be presented is perfect. So there aren't any drafts um, and the uh, translator is there formatting again, stamping again and so on several times. Now luckily that was one um, account, uh, we can say one anecdote, but you could feel the frustration as the um, translator beautifully described this. Um, but clearly there's variety uh, among now. Some um, uh, uh, language companies will have style guides and that's good um, because uh, translators can, uh, can conform to that um, and it gives some consistently at least from some agency. But across the board um, I suppose this is a, a frustrating call but look we've got this in so many areas of translating and interpreting. Can we establish an industry standard here? And it's not going to be an easy process I think with language service providers. So now we've got um, an Australian Association of Language Companies. Uh, eventually we need an industry body. Well, uh, that's another issue. Um, so we made recommendations uh, to the language service providers about style, style sheets, legibility issues, and uh, this repeat document handling, which um, upset um, not just this one translator, but there were several um, accounts of, of difficulties of, of working with um, language service providers. And then uh, we made recommendations to translators. Um, they're very much along the line of, um, uh, of what's already there in the OSIT, um, in, in, in the OSIT guidelines. Um, we've actually sent the recommendations to OSIT so that they can, if they're thinking about future um, um, future versions, they can, they can include that. Um, there's quite a number of issues that, that are clearly from the statistics still not dealt with. Um, how many of uh, the translators actually say um, I'm working from an original or I'm working from uh, an authorised copy or whatever and this of course um, uh, hits up against the, the situation today where almost all originals will be electronic and what does an original mean in this electronic uh, era? Uh, and I think that's an issue, a broad industry issue that, that needs to be confronted. Um, what is the uh, uh, translator to say? Um, and as we saw, there's great diversity in the number of translators who do say, uh, yeah, I'm working from uh, an author, uh, uh, a certified copy or I'm, I'm working from an original and so on. Now um, against that, as I mentioned, uh, many of these documents come from the clients themselves and they are more likely to be the original, though not in every case. Um, so we have this issue now uh, with the uh, advent of uh, almost universal um, electronic passing of documents uh, how do you guarantee authenticity and so on. That's not an issue for translators alone, of course, um, but it is an issue and an issue that's there. So I hope we've um, given some idea. We've uh, got 
some references here. Um, and uh, we've already had one article published in the journal Perspectives. We've got another one in the pipeline. Um, and uh, we looked at this article also in our joint book, Community Translation, a few years ago. And uh, I think that's the end. Thank you. Good. Thank you.